Hello everyone and welcome back to the time series uh, introduction course. Today we're going to be going over some of the basic forecasting models. So these are just models that are pretty standard. Um, they don't necessarily predict well at all but they're just great to understand and, and great to understand why you might use them or why they're great to almost compare to a more complex model. Not necessarily does complex mean good. In fact the simpler you can make a model the more robust it often is. The more complexity uh, means often more overfit. So I like to just make sure that people understand that sometimes simple is good uh, and sometimes complex is bad. So when data, for instance, is almost completely random, a random data model or a simple data model might work almost as well as a complex data model. Because again, if the data is random, you're not really going to do a good job at predicting what the next value is. So if you create a model that's complex, that is trying to find a pattern, that is working so hard to find a pattern, it just won't fit and it won't do well. It's almost just better to guess. Um, so the, the complex models work really great for, you know, when you have clear patterns um, and, and portions of the data set that can be predicted. And we'll go into some of these portions, but they, it really goes down to seasonality and trend and things that are easy to extract from a more complex data set. So some simple methods for predicting data sets. Uh, one is the average method. So the average method really just takes the average of all the observations and guesses that for the future predictions. That's just what it guesses. So if your average is four, from now on it's predicting four, no matter what happens. Um, well, except for if the average obviously changes over time, then that's going to change with that prediction. As you can probably guess, that's not really great, but it's just good to understand. Um, the next one is the naive method. And this one just basically takes the previous observation and uses it uh, for the predicted future values. Um, this one can work sometimes depending on what the data is doing, but again, it's really not doing any fancy anything. It's just guessing that, well, maybe the last value will be this value. Um, from there, there's also the seasonal naive forecast, which as it kind of denotes, it basically seasonally picks the previous value. So April last month showed uh, 12, so we're gonna, or last year, so April this year will say, will also show that same value. So this supposedly is trying to take care of some of that seasonal noise that you might get. Um, but again, it, it really is just predicting the previous value. So if there's something like trend, so if this, data set is not just seasonal but also increasing in value uh, it won't pick that up and you're going to underestimate the value and then finally there's the drift method now drift method basically is more built and geared towards data sets that are linear because literally you're taking the first and the last observation in a time series and basically drawing a line between the two and continuing that line for future observations. So this works great if you're predicting a line, but not so great again if you're predicting something that's seasonal where there's, tr where there's ups and downs. Uh, this is really more if there's an upwards or downwards trend alone. And so that's basically all I wanted to cover here. We're gonna go over and show how some of these models work and kind of how these models look like when you're predicting, um, just to compare them, just to see. It's great to kind of compare these models to the future uh, models you'll be developing because then it kind of tells you, well, this model is not that great because it's predicting just as well as the drift method or the seasonal naive method, whatever it might be, but it really kind of gives you that balance to understand why maybe sometimes a simple model might fit better. So looking at some of these basic models, I wanted to take a kind of manufactured data set that represents, let's say, website visits. So a lot of people these days are very interested in tracking website traffic and figuring out are they increasing, are they decreasing, and, and things of that nature. So this data set that we've created that's a CSV is just basically the website visits. Um, so if we run this first one, you'll notice we'll basically just be setting that website visits, but this is just a basic data set with no time series uh, features as of yet. Thus, we need to basically set it to a time series using the TS function as we learned in the first video. Uh, again, taking that website visits data to that first parameter, we're just going to say it starts in 2000, saying that this is a quarterly frequency. So then that will basically create this website time series, and you'll see that now here in the top right corner. 
From there, we're gonna plot it just so you can kind of see and start to get a general idea of, okay, what does this data look like? And looking at it, you'll notice probably a distinct, what looks like uh, upward trend. Um, maybe there's seasonality here, maybe there's not. It's really hard to tell just based off this, but there's definitely some upwards trend and maybe some weird dips, but nothing that you can kind of pick out by eye. From here, we're gonna create a website train and test data set. We're gonna go into actually testing the model quality later. For now, we're just going to just be creating models and then plotting those models in this video. So here we're gonna, we are gonna split it into a training and test data set using the Windows function. So basically using the Windows function, you can say uh, window and when you wanna start and end a time series, which will basically take a window of a time series. Again, if you wanna be more specific, you can actually specifically state, I want to say, for instance, I would like this data set to end in period or in quarter three, and I'd like this one to start in period or quarter four. So we can create those two data sets. And then basically all you're going to do is create these, to create these models is put in this function, in this case for the mean model, it's just mean F. For the naive model, it's just naive. For the drift model, it is RWF, which stands for random walk forecast with drift. So this drift equals T basically stands for setting, creating a drift. And, and so it'll take this random walk forecast and actually create it with drift. And instead of just being a random walk, it'll actually have drift. And then finally, the seasonal naive forecast is just S naive. Now you'll notice that there's an H parameter and this H parameter stands for horizon. So these are the values that we're predicting or forecasting in the future. So we want to forecast 30 uh, quarters in the future in this case. And we'll show that below in this plot. So again, all you have to do is run this and you'll notice that the, in the values, you'll start getting these, these values for the specific models. And you'll notice there's this little blue arrow, which is great because you can actually click it down and see what type of values does each of these models have. And so what you'll notice is if you scroll down, you'll have a lower and an upper, which basically stand for the lower and upper, um, the lower and upper bounds of confidence, which we'll see as we plot. Um, and there's some other points in here that just basically tell you, for instance, what's the fitted data, what's the residual. So fitted is um, the data that's actually fitting the data set and residuals is the error. And it's just, it's great if you need to learn anything about more about your data set. Um, but we're gonna run all the rest of the models now and you're gonna notice, you know, we get naive M, um, then we're gonna get your drift and then you're gonna get seasonal naive. From here, you can basically just, again, plot um, with your mean model first. And just saying plot with the mean model will actually do both plotting of the original data and as you notice, it has this blue line, so you're also getting the forecast. But now let's say you wanna compare this forecast to the other forecast from the other four models. Well, now you don't want all of the data because you've already plotted the original data, so you wanna only say naive M with this dollar sign mean. So one, again, we've set the color to be something different, that way we can distinguish it. So when you hit run, you'll notice that here, faintly is the green line, which is the naive forecast. Now this is basically just picking this last value and then guessing that and then picking the last value, which is just the previous value. And so that's why you get a straight line again. Now in the drift model, you're finally gonna start seeing a little more of something interesting. So you'll notice this red line and this red line is actually the, again, this starting point to this end point and then a straight line drawn through it. And thus far it is probably the most accurate of all the models. And then finally, let's do seasonal naive. And what you'll notice is there's this down up trend. So it's really kind of not showing what you probably want. It looks seasonal, but at the same time, it's 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 not really matching this data set because it doesn't have that drift value as well. And then if you want to use legend, legend will basically give you uh, the different colors for this model. And that's where we're going to kind of finish off for the day. So you've created this plot that has these four different models predicting future values. Um, as you can see, none of them are doing terribly well, but this is a great start to understanding one, how to use R, but also how to forecast in R. So thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we'll continue this talk 
Uh, we're going to go first into model quality. So how do you actually quantify if this model is good or bad? And then we're going to start going more into auto.arima, Arima, and ETS models. So these are the much more complex models that require a little more understanding of some pretty complex concepts like stationarity, um, autocorrelation, and things of that nature. So we're going to talk a little about about those concepts as well, not just coding, because I think you need to understand those before you can really start programming complex models. So thank you so much for joining us and I will see you next time.